good, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dennis Lim, Director of Programming here at the Film Society of Lincoln Center. This is the opening night of our retrospective, Jane Campion's Own Stories. We are kicking off the retrospective uh, with Jane in person uh, for a career-spanning conversation. So please welcome Jane Campion. Thank you for being here. Uh, I should explain that was uh, a little compilation that the, the Cannes Film Festival produced uh, three years ago when you were the president of the jury there. Uh, and I think that has some, we also produced a trailer uh, for, for our retrospective, but this is a slightly longer one, it has some nice scenes. And, I, and so thank you to Cannes for, for providing it. We thought it'd be a nice way to, to set the scene for this talk. Um, this is, um, as I mentioned, a retrospective that runs through September 17th. We're showing every single one of Jane's films uh, on 35 millimeter. Uh, we're also showing an early uh, television film, Two Friends, on 16 millimeter. We're showing her short films. Uh, tomorrow we are showing uh, the first season of Top of the Lake as a free marathon screening. And um, we're also going to do a sneak preview of episodes one and two. Jane will be back with her collaborators, um, Errol Kleiman and Gerard Lee, and um, one of the stars of um, Top of the Lake China Girl, Alice Englert. So um, do come back for that tomorrow if you can. Um, so you mentioned yesterday to me that this is your first retrospective. Yes, it's my first one, Dennis. How is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> um, have you, have it's you just <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Have you have you declined invitations in the past to, yes, to I have. present? Yeah. You have. Yeah. Okay. What's the what was the? Well, impulse? the motivation for doing it now, I think, was that um, we were just coming out with um, Top of the Lake China Girl, and it it you know I I guess I, it felt like a way of um, looking back and looking forward. Mm -hmm. so I kind of liked it. <laughs> Good. Well, we're, we're glad you're we're glad you think we're glad you think it's time. Yeah. Um, so. Top of the Lake China Girl is the, the sort of occasion for this retrospective. I thought we would actually start there um, and then work, maybe work our way back. Um, this is the, the second season. It's six episodes. Um, the first season was seven episodes. They're each about Actually, that's the same length, but okay. um, for the Americans, six the hours. first time around, we had to divide it up into seven. It was a contractual thing. Right, but they're both about and six hours. They are exactly six hours, yeah, yeah both okay. of them the same length, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about getting, uh, in your case, getting back to television? Because you've actually worked in television. Um, An Angel on My Table was conceived for television, um, uh, although it was released theatrically as a feature film. Um, do, doing the first Top of the Lake, what was the, the motivation to work in a different format? It's very confusing for me, Dennis, because, um, you know, you don't, I never really work in television. I'm just making the best piece of work I can and it's almost always been like even when I was doing Angel at My Table or Two Friends, we were working on film. Yeah. Um, and um, I guess I, what my motivation has always been to, to do the, the script or the story um, that I most loved. Mm -hmm. um, and of the, you know, it, in the way you can do it, in the way that someone's going to give you that freedom or, or pay you to do it. So the motivation for doing... Um, Top of the Lake One was that um, I really love novels and I love that sort of um, length and it was sort of really dying to have a chance to explore more character lines and things like that. And, and I, I was having a break during the time um, or just after making In the Cut and I can remember watching some television and I saw, um, I don't know, maybe got some DVDs from somewhere, I saw um, Deadwood. And I, just, I looked, rose from my chair and I went, oh my God, they're letting them do this. You know, like it was so brave and amazing and incredible and uh, raw. And, it, you know, it really touched, touched um, me and um, inspired me to, to, you know, think, yeah, this is where, this is where the freedom is, mm -hmm. actually. This is where they kind of let you do what you want. Because mm -hmm. I think that um, cinema's kind of, 
at that time had a bit of a crisis where everybody was always concerned about, oh, well, will, it, you know, will this character be likable? Um, right. Will these storylines be likable? Um, Is that, uh, were, those were, those were those questions you heard early in your career, or were they? Um, I don't think so. I think, you know, it's gone through, ha like, when I first got involved in cinema, I mean, I, you know, when I first fell in love with cinema, um, it felt like the most um, dangerous, exciting, edgy place that you could explore ideas. Um, but as time went on, it felt like a more and more conservative, um, you right. know, pleasing event. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll just please people. And that, you know, for me is just kind of not inspiring yeah. in the same way. Or you, you, you yeah. So, um, it, television, um, a lot of people keep on going on about it, it's golden age. Um, but there does seem to be, you know, what my experience was, um, that when I went to BBC Two and I told Ben Stevenson the idea for the women's camp and um, all the other, you know, you know, the matriarchy against the patriarchy and the idea of this pregnant 12-year-old, he was like, wow, I love it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and this was like, at, you know, a breakfast meeting in London and he's going, this is fantastic, I love it, Jane, that's great, you know, and I'm just after I've made Bright Star, and it, you know, and right. he said, now, Jane, can you write it down, you know? <laughs> and you'd had, I mean, some difficulty with a film like In the Cut, in terms of uh, difficult material, getting that film off the ground was, was, was not easy, even then, right? More than yeah, I went through a few um, dramas, like uh, um, Harvey Weinstein, had it for a while. Um, there was some very funny stories with it, like Nicole and I were developing it together, right. and um, people saw us talking together at the Venice Film Festival. He got the idea that it was going to be this really hot number, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, that, and he bought it actually for an enormous amount of money. But that <laughs> and he hadn't read the book. I think and then he, I yeah, know, yeah, maybe he hadn't read the book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then he had reservations when he read the script. He just didn't think it was the sort of, um, I guess, sexy thriller that he was expecting. Right. And then things happened in Nicole's life where she didn't feel up to doing that project and ended up being done with Meg and um, Pathé bought it. Right. So yeah. I guess it you know, went through yeah. a few lives. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it is a very edgy story, yeah. to tell yeah. the truth. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll come back uh, to In the Car in a bit, but just to, to, to get back to what you were saying about this working with this the scope, the length, this you know novelistic uh, scope of, of Top of the Lake. It was great, I think, for me to see you work in these you know six-hour chunks because I've always found your films really dense and you're really rich with detail, um, full of like great you know supporting characters and things. That, and I felt like with with six with six hours, you really were able to go off on tangents and 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 let things things breathe. Um, but can you talk about this the how different was that process? Was it just like writing a very long script, or did you think about it in fundamentally different ways? Well, I, I did think I, I do think I thought about it in fundamentally different ways, but I also have to say I didn't do it alone. Um, I wrote with uh, my friend from film school, Gerard Lee, and um, it, it, that was one of the gorgeous experiences to have a, a writer with you the whole time and lounge around and discuss your life and what's wrong with it and then do a little bit of work and <laughs> <laughs> um, you know we we've now written 12 hours of drama together um, and um, I mean to begin with I think we were quite damaged by the whole industry our lives our souls everything and we would have these conditions under whereby when one of us got into one of our soft spot subjects, you know, like we've been treated badly, blah. Um, uh, Jared was feeling he'd been very, treated very badly by the industry and he would rave on about how people had copied his ideas for quite some time. He's here tonight. And we, we, we just, yeah, we developed a system where we give him, like, I'd say, Jared, okay, 10 minutes. <laughs> Talk. And when that 10 minutes is up, it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, what was kind of sweet, and we were mentioning it the other day, is that, you know, there has been, I think, a kind of a healing, because we, we don't need to do that anymore. We've actually run out. But it's a really good system if anyone... <laughs> it's got someone, oh, you know, if you have an obsessive aspect. <laughs> it's 
the benefits of collaboration. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, the writing. Um, the thing with Jared and me is that we... Um, we should tell people that um, Jared worked with you on Sweetie and yeah, also did, and on, uh, on and some of your short films, Passionless Moments. Yeah, he, right. he looked after the kid. Um, he's, he, he's credited on yes. Peel as yes. the... the uh, child wrangler or something, child wrangler. I think. <laughs> <laughs> and we co-wrote, co-directed um, Passionless Moments together as well. And, um, yeah, so... You know, and Jared was a writer even before you know going to film school. He was like a big grown-up guy who'd written a book. You know. So um, I think most people here have seen Top of the Lake season one, uh, but not season two. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it still revolves around um, the character played by Elizabeth Moss, but it's in a very different um, setting. The um, first season was in very rural. Um, it's beautiful landscapes in South Island, New Zealand. Um, and the second season is set um, in uh, Sydney, where you've lived um, most of your life. Um, can you talk about wanting to you know, explore a, a different environment with this one? We're going to show a clip in a bit, but maybe you can just yeah. talk about the uh, change in setting. We were really surprised and kind of um, moved by how successful the first series was for us, um, especially in America and Europe, um, we, and it kind of inspired us to feel like, you know, we'd like to write something else for people that um, like our tone or what we're able to do and how we like to do it. And um, our producer said, look, we, we, we can fund it, we have the money now. You can. And I remember thinking, oh man, it is a lot of work and, and Jared, who's, I've never ever heard him talk like this. He'd ring me up and say, you owe it to the world. <laughs> you have to do it. People need to work. They need jobs. <laughs> I was like, oh, man. And I say, well, we have to think of some ideas, you know. <laughs> and it, um, he thought of some and I thought of some, but all the time when I kept thinking, when I, when I tried to think of a, you know, another six hours set in New Zealand, I felt um, uninspired. I felt like you know, a lot of those themes of the wilderness and paradise and um, that sort of rough, raw um, you know, female-male thing that was going on there, um, it felt like I'd explored it um, you know, in some kind of basic way and it just didn't get me going and, and I started to think about moving the story to Sydney that um, Robin Griffin could have, you know, had actually quite a tough time, that the little girl, Tui, who um, looked like her and her boyfriend, Jono, were going to sort of become family for, hardly knew them, actually, in reality, and probably would have moved back to her brother's place and her pony and a dog, and um, that she might have tried to have babies and that didn't work out, and then Jono played up, and, um, you know, the relationship fell apart and um, the only way that Robin would know how to um, kind of keep living in this, um, you know, here she is in paradise, miserable. The only way that she would know how to kickstart her life would be to go back, uh, you know, to the force to, and to be a detective and back in Sydney to try and restart things. And um, back in Sydney, um, what we remembered was that, that that was where she had her baby after, <laughs> this is such a dramatic story, after the rape, <laughs> after the triple rape. <laughs> um, and that, um, you know, <laughs> contrary to how she felt during the first series, now she um, was thinking, you know, I, I do want to show up for my daughter. I, I didn't write back to her before because I felt that you know, it'd be easier for, for her if she never knew how things happened. But now I, I just want to show up in case she needs me. Maybe I need her or whatever it was. There was this drive towards um, finding that, um, that, that baby, that person that she carried in her head all that time. And I'm, you know, I find it very romantic and very beautiful, but also completely mysterious what it must be like to have adopted out a child um, and, you know, carry that thought of that child so particularly um, 
you know, for the 17 years that Mary would be aged at that point and for Mary also to have in her mind that mythical mother um, who has, I mean, forever caring, thinking, holding a light to her or, or whatever it would be in Mary's head that she might have been doing. Yeah. So that's actually a great setup for the clip. Do you, should we say anything more or just, or just roll it? Okay, we're going to play um, a clip from uh, Hop of the Late China Girl. This is from uh, the second episode. Uh, so that was uh, Robin, played by Elizabeth Moss, and Mary, played by Alice Englert, who is your daughter. Uh, um, did you have Al um, Alice in mind as you were writing? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, when I did the maths and worked out that this was a part that Alice could play, um, I was really excited about it because um, Alice had been wanting to be an actor since she was about uh, 13 and uh, one of the ways we bonded um, together was um, when Alice got scripts to do auditions, um, you know, we'd work together on it and it's sort of, you know, it's, an, it's a beautiful adult platform for a um, teenager and parent to um, work together on and, and I just realised how, you know, good she is. She just can ground material so beautifully and I really wanted to write a, um, a challenging role for her. Um, I mean, it's not inspired by her life, but it's inspired by her dad. <laughs> yeah. Was this a difficult scene to write? It's a very important scene in, in, in the context of, um, yeah. of the series. Um, I love writing this scene. Um, this was one of my favourite ones I think I've ever written. Um, I love it because it's such a cliched event, you know, and hard to imagine how you could put any air in something like that. Um, and, and so my desire was to um, turn it around somehow to make it really tender and really surprising. Um, to really, you know, and also of course with, um, you know, working with imagining Elizabeth Moss who really is the queen of mood and tone. Mm -hmm. And she can, she, I mean, she barely says anything but she's just so present, so exquisitely holding the moments as in my view. Yeah. Um, so it was a delight to think about it. And you know, when I have to write something like this, I'm storing it up like, you know, some yummy thing in the fridge. <laughs> that I'm just waiting for that moment when, you know, I'm gonna get the book, um, the rainy day outside, the cookies, and um, it's all coming together like a perfect storm, and then I'll, I'll write that scene. <laughs> Did you direct that scene as well? You had a co-director on, yeah, on no, the series. I, no, I didn't direct yeah. that scene, yeah. yeah. Was it a deliberate choice to not direct Alice in some of these scenes um, or? No, I mean, it's just like that was an episode two, that was Ari's yeah. episode. And uh, you know, to tell you the truth, he's, I think better than me. <laughs> he's a really good director. Um, I love his work. And um, I th one of the wonderful things about doing these series, and you know, I worked with Garth Davis last time, is to enjoy um, the companionship of another director. Both of us say that, you know, being a director can be quite lonely. Um, and um, I think what happened with Garth and with Ariel is that we, we really bond together, we really love the material, and we also compete with each other and support each other. So it's a kind of lively environment. <laughs> but, you know, the competition is so cute and ridiculous because, you know, whatever he does is good, it's, or whatever I do is good, or competitive or whatever, it's, it's always going to be good for the thing, you know? Right. Yeah. So I think it, as, like the first, um, first series, um, it is a, a sort of a crime story, there is a, a mystery, um, there is a, a victim, a culprit, um, but it also, as the scene suggests, I think it's, it's very much um, a piece about um, motherhood and parenthood. Um, and. Can you talk a bit about, I think you, you do seem to have, I think, a real interest in this genre, which you've um, deployed in very interesting ways um, in both, both Top of the Lakes and in, in the cut. Um, but you're also always interested in bringing in um, thematic complications. Um. <laughs> yes, <Okay. laughs> no, what shall I talk about? Um, yeah, I do like crime stories. Yeah. Um, I just, um, 
I guess it appeals to that part of me about, you know, I like to find out what the truth was, you know. And it's sort of things like Lance Armstrong, you know, is he telling the truth or not? You know, will we ever know, you know? <laughs> and I do get quite obsessive about um, the truth and it mattering. Does it matter? Does it really matter? I mean, and the great thing with crime stories is it really matters because someone's dead or been killed or something's actually happened. Um, so in this instance, somehow the truth really d is vibrant. And, um, and there's this sort of, you know, the cr you have the crime and there's a sort of vacuum and space around it where you imagine all sorts of options and, and what, the what could have happened. Mm -hmm. And as much as you imagine it, there is actually a reality, you know, which you may or may not discover. So I just find that, I don't know, really beautiful. And it's also always that mythic thing of, um, you know, you, the detective has to go into the space where the criminal was, um, who did the act. And, you know, so it's that drawing of darkness. You know, I mean, what I love about, you know, humanity is that anything that any one of us does, we have to be able to imagine it. Or we can imagine it. We can imagine anything. You know, like every human being takes us, um, or any act that they do can, I think, requires us to, or challenges you to imagine it yourself. And so, you know, crimes take you to the darkest things that people do and, um, you know, and I guess it's the restitution of society that the detective represents and every detective has their different qualities and we have the damaged Elizabeth Moss Robin Griffin character. Um, should put it the other way around. <laughs> damaged. <laughs> damaged Robin. Robin Griffin, played by Elizabeth Moss. <laughs> um, and, you know, what I love about her particularly is um, that, you know, as a woman, I think she's, um, she, she holds that feeling of being overlooked um, as, as a kind of person and that the, the crimes or the people that she offered, you know, in my story so far has, has, has supported, a, uh, you know, innocence with people without power. And she chooses to, you know, in, in a way she's... Um, She's kind of restituting herself as well as the, the girl in the suitcase in this new series and um, little Tui, the, the lost pregnant girl. Yeah. yeah. The other thing about these, about crime stories, and certainly in these, is that they're often, they often involve, um, the victims are often women, um, and they're, you know, they're violent, misogynist crimes, um, and which sort of involves, requires you to sort of, it's, it's very clear in, in the cut as well to sort of like um, imagine these misogynist crimes, misogynist characters, misogynist environments, um, very, which are very present in uh, South of Lake season one, all those alpha males, these almost feral men. Um, you know, you were talking about patriarchy, matriarchy, and also in- They're just kind of normal in New Zealand and Australia, Venus. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and here as well, it's just a pretty misogynist And in uh, season two, this very misogynist sort of police force that Robin finds herself in as That's well. That's pretty normal. Yeah. <laughs> but do you, um, I'm just wondering what it's like for you to have to imagine these misogynist environments. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not imagine them, draw them. It'd be nice to imagine. just imagine them. <laughs> but to, to represent to them, depict them, to you know, put them on screen. I, I mean, love I it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I've got a big alpha male in me, you know. Um, uh, when, when Jared and I Im improvise, you know, <laughs> there was a moment <laughs> in the first series when Jared was playing the little girl Tui and I was, you know, Matt Mitchum, you know. <laughs> I, uh, that's what I, you know, I love about it. But there is some, you know, times when you know, some stories, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm quite craven about crime stories and we'll listen to all sorts of that, but I have heard some audio recordings of, um, you know, actual murderers talking that are just so grim I can't even, I had to stop, I couldn't bear to listen to them gloating about what they did, it's just too much, yeah. So I think we're going to move um, back in time <laughs> to... <laughs> um, 
to the, the not the very beginning um, of your, your career, but um, your first theatrical feature, um, Sweetie, um, which you just mentioned, which you co-wrote with Jared in 1989. Um, and uh, we, we're going to show a, a brief clip from Sweetie now. This is from 1989, and you, you had made uh, quite a few short films um, before that. Um, I'd like to talk, maybe talk about how you got into film school in the first place. You studied um, anthropology, and then you went to art school. Um, what led you to filmmaking? Um, well, when I was at art school, I started to make little plays, and um, I was in them, and I really hated being in them. <laughs> And so I decided to try and film them with other people. And um, then I realised I was making a film, you know, uh, which I'd already always loved, but never thought that, you know, I'd be able to do it. So I started, I just was using a Super 8 manual about how to make a movie and use the school camera. And, um, yeah, I made this epic thing called Tissues and um, used that to get into the school. Um, I, I just absolutely loved doing it. All my friends were in it. And um, I edited it myself, and um, actually it's pretty rough, but <laughs> um, actually, you know, you know how Tiny Super 8 is actually hand neg matched and everything, which isn't really that good, so a lot of the, it looks pretty out of sync when you see it now. But um, it, I really got the bug. I mean, I could just work any number of hours on it, any number. I mean, I can remember being in my underpants, hanging pieces of, you know, film and partner at the time coming and going, you got me to bed. <laughs> I go, hi. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got really obsessive. And um, I, I, I hope not to have to go to film school. I was hoping to... Um, write a script and get some funding and, you know, another short film, but that didn't work out. I mean, I have, you know, bad stories about that too, funny, bad stories. It's just, uh, yeah, very bad. And, um, and finally, the only place I could sort of move, my, move forward was that the film school accepted me. And, you know, I remember my parents going, what, another school? I was going like, yeah, well, you get paid to go. Actually, you know, you did. You actually got paid to go to the school that I was, that we went to film and television. I know it's an unbelievable change in time, eh? Mm. But, um, yeah, we got $75 a week, which is, you know, like it must be about $250, $300 now. Mm. And they paid for your films. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, those were the good old real egalitarian days, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> what um, and what led you to art school before that? Um, I'd always loved painting. I did. I studied art history at school, yeah. and um, I loved to draw. Um, did, I you, thought, did you did yeah. you continue to paint and draw? No, I sort of when I went to art school, I realised I wasn't very good at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really, yeah. I, I really, my energy really came together when I started making film. It was sort of like, you know, storytelling, acting. Because right. my parents were theatre people and um, I've always been really interested in theatre and in acting and the problems of it and all the focus of it. And my mother was an actor. Actually, she's an angel at my table. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it just sort of brought, you know, it felt like going back to when I was a kid and playing these very long games that we used to th play um, and it, it, it just felt like, it not work, it just felt like, oh my God, this is just the best fun ever. You know, like putting worlds together, doing things, you know. Mm -hmm. it just, I just loved it. And I, and I had no idea if I was doing it well or not. I had no idea and you know, like that, that was such a shock to me. I mean, the beautiful thing about my first film was I didn't even know what a wide shot was. And right. someone was saying to me, which was so weird, he said to me, um, he'd, oh, someone said, I'll show your film to, um, you know, John, blah, blah. He's been to the London Film School. I was like, oh, okay. And I'd always <laughs> travelled around in my Datsun with a projector in case anyone wanted to see my film. <laughs> 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 and 
But they said, oh, what have you been doing? I said, oh, you know, made a film. I said, oh, really? I said, do you want to see it? <laughs> <laughs> and so I showed, I brought it out and showed this guy and he, had a, he was sort of a woolly-headed looking guy with a big black beard, you know, a bit of a chubster and he was sitting there and going, yeah, yeah. And we was like, what do you think? You know, what do you think? <laughs> he said, um, you could have some more wide shots, I think. I thought, wide shots? What the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> they all fit on the same screen, you know? <laughs> I had no idea that there were different lenses, you know, like, I just... <laughs> if it was in the frame, if there was a light reading on it, we would cheer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and actually, that was the beginning of my agony in filmmaking when I realised there was, you know, so many choices, like, oh my God, you know? Because then I, I, and I still to this day, I feel exhausted by planning, you know, how to cover something. Coverage for dirt is a fucking nightmare. Because I literally think of everything that can be done and then try to choose which of those I think are best. And before, I would be like, it's on the screen, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we have a light reading, we're done, you know? <laughs> So I'm curious, in those days, which, um, which artists and which filmmakers were, were most important to you as a young painter, filmmaker? You David Lynch. Yeah. <laughs> I think David Lynch, um, yeah. Boone Well, yeah. um, Jim Jarmusch, I mean, people like, you know, around me. And, um, but I, I, I'm really very open-hearted when it comes to filmmakers and, you know, from the moment I started watching films, um, I felt like it was the best thing ever in the world and that these people were telling stories like Coppola, like Apocalypse Now, like Godfather, like Bertolucci. Um, just, they were telling stories that were really interesting about being a human. Mm. And, you know, mostly when you're around in the world, it's kind of boring as a young person. Like, there's people talking at you, what are you going to do, how are you, you know, that sort of conversation. <laughs> and how did you do at school and what are you doing next? And, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> and then you go to the movies and there's people like sharing this amazing quality of vision and view and you think, oh, maybe people are okay after all, you know. <laughs> Maybe it's a great tribe to be part of, and uh, and I, you know, like I would spend my life in, in the movie theater once I got the hang of it. I just went to everything all the time. And um, what was the question? Um, filmmakers <laughs> who were important to you. It's interesting that you mentioned Lynch yeah. because he also came to filmmaking from art school. Um, that yeah. Was his. yeah, he did, and um, I think he's really, really important to me. I, recently, I was asked to write something about him for the time. Um, magazine, I think it was, um, and I went back and looked at a razor head, and I was just like, "Oh my God, where did Lynch come from?" <laughs> it's he's so extraordinary, yeah. and um, while well, I was at the Cannes Film Festival, you know, and they had all the directors that ever won any Palm Doors, I actually ended up standing really near to him and holding hands with him a lot of the time. <laughs> He was, seemed to be quite happy about it. We'd turn this way and hold hands and then turn to the other <laughs> side of the photographers. It was like a real high moment for me. That <laughs> it's, anyway. um, no, I think you can, I do, I do I, if I recall um, your early shorts, actually you did win a Palme d'Or at Cannes for Peel, one of your short films as well. So you're, um, um, they were compared to Lynch. Um, Sweetie as well, um, but I, I think what's striking about I your... Mean, I tried to copy Lynch, but I ended up making Sweetie, you know, it's just like... <laughs> I <laughs> tried as hard as I could, and the fact that it's not the same is just because I couldn't do it well enough. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think what's striking about those early films is um, the, the, the visual inventiveness, but also the control of, of tone, which is something that I think is... Um, Lynch is also such a director of mood and tone, and I, I think uh, you you are as well. Um, and you know, I'm wondering if that's something that you work hard on, or if that just sort of comes naturally. There's um, Sweetie is a film with a very particular, very distinctive tone. 
Yeah, I think tone is um, really important to me. I think, you know, w w for example, when I think about the other directors that I might work with on the Top of the Lake series, that's the thing that I wonder most about. Are they going to hear the tone or feel the tone of this or the humour and the combination of absurdity, humour, tenderness? Um, that is, you know, how Jared and I basically see the world. And, um, and that's, you know, absolutely crucial. And it's really hard, to, um, you know, to say what that is. But when you look at their work, you know, if, if they hit an, if they hit a comic note too hard, you know, like ha 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 ha, <laughs> you, think, you know, no. I mean, I the way we do our jokes, it's like doesn't matter if you actually laugh or you don't laugh. You know, <laughs> it's like ha ha, that was funny, ha ha. You know. <laughs> that's not going to work and same with the feeling thing you know like it's got to be in the air in a really light way mm -hmm. and um, I mean you can't have the agenda to make someone feel you have to have the agenda to tell the story um, with feeling or tenderly yeah. and however anybody receives it is is however it's received. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you mentioned humor, but I, I don't know that I would say you've ever really made an all-out comedy, but I also think you've never made a film that doesn't have humor in some way. I think they're all funny films in, in, in some way or other. It's sometimes a very, very dark humor, but um, I think it's something that's always, <laughs> always present. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you got to laugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to ask you one question about that scene in Sweetie that made me think um, that that that's um, uh, the main character, not the title character, who is her sister. But um, that she's taking a meditation class in that Kay, in yeah. that scene. K, yeah, yeah, and, um, and this Eastern spirituality is something that's sort of come up in your work from time to time. Think of Holy Smoke. That's um, true. I'm just wondering if it's something that is part of my life or. Important to you in some way yeah, both, of, of yeah. interest, yeah. Yeah, both. You know, you try to figure out how to live this life. Take some notes from Buddha and people <laughs> like that. But um, at the time, um, when I was at film school, Jared and I were actually partners as well as filmmakers and um, for making stuff together. Um, Jared had done transcendental meditation um, for many years and he said that I ought to do it too because... David Lynch too, another connection. Yeah. Um, Jared said that I should definitely do it because then I'd learn something about my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, at that point, you know, my experience was sort of more or less Kay's experience that just being still was, like, terrible. In fact... <laughs> because like you know we got so busy and I was like oh and it took me you know a, a long time to to work out that you know that that's what I should be noticing that's you know my mind was busy but my idea was to just keep going a bit faster than the mind you know so you never sort of really know who you are or what's going on but um, yeah I guess you know when you when you're you know making films and you're telling stories you try to do stuff about things that you personally um, are discovering in the world and you know I guess when we do Top of the Lake that comes out particularly with the women's camp and the GJ character um, who has a particular take on life and um, she's she he because she's based on this guy that I met called Yuji Krishnamurta Murti um, who's not J.K. Krishnamurti, but he was a very, like, um, Dardarist kind of uh, enlightened guy. Although he would never say that. He always says what Holly Hunter says, like, oh, I live differently and, and, and these kinds of things. But I guess he was about the most extraordinary person I've ever met. Um, and so I felt like when we... Or Jared both said... I said, well, we're getting old. I guess we should try and put our what we know <laughs> about the world down now, you know, before we get too old to do it. <laughs> you know, we tried. <laughs> okay, we're going to play another clip. Um, this is from uh, The Piano from 1993. 
So this remains in your most commercially successful film. Not only that, I think it's one of the most commercially successful independent films of all time. Um, do you have a sense of what what resonates so strongly with people with this film? Um, <clears throat> well, we were actually pretty surprised. Yeah. Um, I think it was one of the top ten grossing films of the year in the U.S. that year. It was really yeah, you know, we were pretty surprised. We really thought we'd, you know, we we made this film with the money from CB2000, so it was like this was a concrete maker who had decided in his last years of life that he he wanted he he'd seen a Bertolucci m movie, The Last Emperor, and he just thought, what have I been doing all this time? This 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 is the best thing ever. Like I thought when I first saw the <laughs> movies. And he decided to just fund filmmakers and share profits with them. And, you know, he, he did a few films and this was one of them. Um, so we did it. We were allowed to do it exactly as we wanted to for the amount that it cost. And um, it was an incredible situation, actually. It was hard for us to even believe. Uh, and we just thought we were making, I guess, this, an art house movie which might have a little bit of a crossover. Um, but at the same time, you know, we also met Harvey Weinstein then, and Harvey Weinstein was extraordinary in loving up these movies and bringing them to a wider audience. And, uh, you know, it, it was a, a time in film history, I think, um, that someone like Harvey, with his energy and his um, gaminess about it, you know, really was able to do that. And I think, um, you know, I don't know, I mean, talking to people since then, it, 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 I, I guess it's such a female point of view and uh, the fact that she doesn't speak, it's, it, it's that um, retire, you know, like her stubbornness, her strength of point of view, her interiority and this piano speaking for her and the, um, I think it speaks a lot to, well, men and women um, about, um, I don't know what can't be spoken about, you know, or not having a voice, not being given a voice in the world. Um, but it's not to say that you don't have an opinion. Yeah. Um, it's, you mentioned you know, female po a female point of view. I'm wondering if somebody who went to art school and film school in the 70s and 80s was feminist film theory, you know, something that was formative, important to you. I mean, it's it was obviously kind of hard to avoid at the time, I would imagine, in, in certain circles. And Well, um, we didn't really have that much going on. I mean, you know, film school is a really conservative place. <laughs> it's like, I've never met such a collection of ordinary folk, mm. you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's worse these days, but yeah. Yeah, but uh, art school was pretty wild. It was really wild, crazy wild. Um, and that's where I really learned everything at art yeah. school. But what I was really, really lucky was that there was a group of um, feminist women in Sydney who really shook up the administration and the film commission and really insisted on parity um, for f female um, directors being given an opportunity. And I was someone that totally benefited from their energy and from their movement and, if, and, and in fact in some ways I think they sort of like they s you know put their heart and souls into making it possible for them to do stuff but really it was so exhausting for them doing that that it ended up being a gift right. to someone like myself so I'm, I am really grateful and it does really make great sense and I think people are talking about it again now yeah. in Sydney and saying well we've got to have a, you know equal amount of um, film money spent on women and men because a lot of our money is just public money and you know why should the guys get it mm -hmm. Th there is absolutely no <coughs> reason at all i mean it's tax money you know everybody puts that money up there so it should be equal it should be you know half half it must annoy you that you're often so repeatedly described as the only woman to have won the palm d'or i mean i feel like it's it's something that comes up every year in can you're mentioned as you know the only the only uh, in, in 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 the festivals, you know, it's nearly six, sixty year history. It's 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 quite absurd. Yeah. It, I, yeah, it is. It's really. I mean, you know, the festival has been really good to me, and um, 
you know, when I talked to Terry and the other people about it, I mean, the year that I was president, I suggested the idea that I should have an all-female jury. Um, you know, because first of all, he how said, that, oh, how do you have any ideas yeah. for how you would like this <laughs> run? And I said, oh, yeah, uh, I thought about it. And I, first of all, I said, no, no, you just do what you want. And then I went, actually, I do have an idea. Um, I think it would be great um, to have an all-female jury because for the very first time, all those male filmmakers would have to think, what are the women thinking? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what are the women going to like about my movie? It, it would be good. It's a really good... <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've spent my whole life thinking, what are the men thinking, mm -hmm. you know? I just really think it's time, and it would be uh, beautiful for them to think, what are the women thinking? In, 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 a, in a different way than they've ever had to think before. Yeah. And, you know, the, I, my career's gone long enough that I have spent time feeling that anything to do with being a woman, with what you're interested in, is irrelevant and boring and un uninteresting. You know, and that that sort of subject matter is like, oh, the girls are doing their thing, you know? <laughs> you know, right, now the real thing's happening, you know? Right. <laughs> There's, there is really that feeling that, oh, the women filmmakers, you know? It's the ghetto, you know? Better let them have their moment. And it, that's what's really irritating because, you know, I know that, um, you know, Women artists, women filmmakers are fucking awesome. And they're as clever and as interesting and as creative as, as anybody else, you know. This is not like, oh, guys, run faster, you know. Right. <laughs> it's not sports. Yeah. So you don't have to have the women filmmakers and the male filmmakers and, you know, uh, you know, we just really do know that, you know, women given the opportunity can do great stuff. We're, we're going to open it up to um, audience questions in a bit. I did want to ask you um, about your... The Piano is one of the films that you wrote yourself, I believe, right? Because you've, you've, on some films you've worked with co-writers, so you've worked with other people's scripts. Um, and I imagine this was a fairly um, deeply researched film, and I'm wondering if you're... You know, I'm also struck by your approach to period films. You seem to... You, I think you are one of the filmmakers who makes like some of the freshest seeming period films and that you seem to avoid period cliches and that comes across in, in so many ways and whether it's just how characters are written, how you know characters are cast and design and music and, and sometimes just deliberately using anachronism like you do in Portrait of a, of a Lady and um, I'm wondering about research and your approach to, to period which is something you've done several times now. Well, when you mention um design and period and everything. I, I'm thinking now of my beautiful friend Janet Patterson who died last year. Um, very um, shockingly quickly from cancer and um, she was a legend for me, a real companion and friend. I met her at the ABC when we did Two Friends. She just was um, so extraordinary and such a sense for um, costume and also, you know, design and costumes she did on the piano and um, Bright Star as well as the design and also a portrait of a lady. So I was working with this um, extraordinary female heroine, you know, that Janet was for me. And in fact, um, the look even of um, Ada and the piano was um, really how Janet Patterson looked. Janet Patterson was like five foot ten with beautiful black hair and a sort of most Grecian perfect face. and these eyes that had a real fire of fury in them. But, you know, also could be really, really kind. And, um, I, you know, I really felt she had my back. And that, you know, together that we could dream, you know, into these spaces. And uh, I guess also I've, been, I've always been a big reader. I, you know, I, I, lo I love my 19th century novels and they feel like my life. And... Um, I read a lot of diaries as well, you know, did for the piano of people coming out to New Zealand at that time, and diaries make things feel very fresh and very real. Um, so, yeah, I just think they're people with different outfits on, you know? Yeah. 
did your background as an anthropologist come in handy when you were working on, on the piano? I would imagine with yeah. certain <laughs> some of that material, that particular you know period of New Zealand history. And yeah, I I don't really know how it really f figures, but I've always been extremely nosy, um, and really fascinated by what how people do things, how they organise their bedroom, their kitchens. You know, you know, as a kid going home to someone else's friend's house, I was like amazed at, you know, like, oh, I wanted to follow the mother around and see what she was up to, what she was going to cook for dinner. And the friend would be going, oh, come, let's play, you know. <laughs> and I would find it absolutely rivetingly interesting and I find all human beings rivetingly interesting and I'd just be really happy and just staring at people all day long, but Jared um, <laughs> has told me to stop staring. <laughs> Makes people really uncomfortable, but, you know, I... <laughs> And I don't know if it's, um, you know, I am really intrigued by looking at people. And I don't know if that's why I liked anthropology or the other way around, um, but I am, you know, a very happy observer, yeah. A full house here with, I'm sure, a lot of questions, so we're gonna take some from the audience. Um, there are ushers with wireless mics, so if you would raise your hand and, um, yeah, let's start over there. Hi. Hi. Is it on? You can hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, I really appreciated uh, what you said about, uh, at the beginning, about how you are trying to uh, make your, no your films move in the same way that novels do, how they're hitting. Speed. Sorry, I just can't hear you quite now. Can you speak into the mic a little bit more? Like this? Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, I, I really appreciated what you said about uh, structuring your films in the same way that uh, a novel moves in the sense that novels hit peaks and that there's room in a novel for subplots. Um, and so I think the interesting idea with like a novel is that um, in order to uh, you know, create character, in order to create setting and plot, uh, you, a writer only has language, um, whereas with, as a, f a filmmaker has a whole swath of other tools that um, they can use to create a film. Um, which I, I don't, I'm not a filmmaker, so I would imagine that like, it can be very enticing and exciting, but also overwhelming in certain cases. Uh, what do you think are, have been the most helpful tools to create that effect in your career? Pencil and paper. I'm, I'm not kidding. I do a lot of drawing and sketching for um, working out my shot lists and things like that. So, and it, it may be, in the end, um, it's not so much that, oh, that's the perfect drawing, but it's sort of like imagine time when I imagine the scene. Imagine what the, different, the actors might do or where they might be and what I might need in props and how it might look and the um, lighting, um, how that might be, how the camera might move. Um, I, as I said before, it's actually exhausting and I try and imagine these things, but when you actually come to set, you you know that you've thought about what you want, what you need, and then you can kind of throw it away in a way. And, well, I, I, in a way I do throw it away, but then when I look back at what we actually shot, I go, oh, that's exactly like that drawing. So it's sort of like I'm imprinting in myself what to look for, you know, with my paper and pencil. And people that don't draw or can't draw um, have other ways of doing it, you know, they've, they've they photograph or they video the scene or something like that. <laughs> um, the question is, at what point in, in the development of the piano did Holly Hunter come into the picture? Um, well, Jan Chapman and I, my producer, we were doing a sort of a tour of the world, because you, when you go to Australia, when you leave from Australia, you don't, you know, just go to England, come back, do that. So we were going and meeting lots of people and also talking about financing. And, you know, the one thing Jan and I would always say is, like, don't talk about money, OK? Because neither of us knew anything. <laughs> Whatever they said, don't speak about money. Um, but people were became, becoming aware that we were looking for this, this woman who could play piano, who didn't um, speak, and that she could come, you know, with any language or accent, really. And, um, you know, we were meeting a lot of different people and she was described in the script as being like my friend Janet, um, very tall and dark. And so, you know, we heard from Holly's agent saying, oh, Holly Hunter would like to meet you. So, well, she's a great actor, but she's very short. <laughs> <laughs> just, 
really a long way from the description. And so we sent that back to her agent and said, oh yeah, well, but Holly would still really like to meet, you know, she's really dying to, she really loves the idea of this character. And so we, you know, we sent another band and said, well, um, it's just the description of the character is really, really different. <laughs> we just don't want to waste her time, you know. And so that goes back and then Holly Hunter still wants to meet. And, and we went like, okay, <laughs> you know, what do, we, what do we care? We'd love to meet Holly, you know. <laughs> so um, I think Janet already got home and I had my, um, I had a video camera and um, Holly came to my motel room and I remember even now, do you know, she just sort of sat on the bed and we said, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do an audition, make it something. And it's really hard to audition for someone who doesn't speak. <laughs> wander around the room looking meaningfully <laughs> um, so you know we, we got her to do her voiceover and um, and you know just had the camera on her face and I remember at the very end of it she just gave me a, um, a, a CD a little tape um, and she said oh look this is my piano play and I said oh you played the piano she said oh yeah Anyway, I didn't really think about it. I thought, well, I did that, you know. Because it's so overwhelming when you meet people in all different circumstances, some in Paris, some, you know, in New York and LA. And then we got together back in Sydney and um, we started to play all the audition tapes. And, um, I, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how Hollies would play. And actually the guys, my husband at the time, Colin and Jan's husband, were starting to watch them. They were more interested than we were. And they went, wow, you know, and we said, come and have a look at this, quick. And we went in there and there was Holly. And, um, and it was extraordinary how mesmerizing her eyes were. And um, that was something, you know, I, I didn't realize when I was actually just filming her, but, you know, seeing her there, I just felt this connection. And everybody did, we all did. And then, I said, oh, look, I've got this tape of her. Let's put on a piano player and let's see what, how good she is, you know. And we put it on and she was like, you know, extremely good piano player. <laughs> so, well, I guess, you know, that character could be very tall or very small, you know. <laughs> <laughs> to, to follow up on that, I feel like we, we, we should... I would love to hear you talk a bit about your, the way you work with actors because your films are filled with great performances. Um, and also, I think, great casting, which you talked about how, you know, Holly ended up in the piano, but you think of Nicole Kidman in Portrait of a Lady and Meg Ryan in, in The Cut and these completely counterintuitive, almost, you know, roles for them at the time, at those, that, um, at that moment in their careers. Can you talk about your, the way you work with actors? Does it change from person to person or do you have a, a style? I, I really do love actors and actors have taught me everything that I know about acting. Um, I've been educated on the job. I started off terrified of them, that they would wreck my short films and scripts and everything. <laughs> I, I, I would never work with an actor. <laughs> <laughs> I work with friends and then boss them around like mad, you know? <laughs> no, don't say it like that, say it like this, you know? <laughs> everything that's like absolutely what you shouldn't do. And they say, you want it like that? And I say, yeah, that's pretty good, like that, but a bit more emphasis on this word, you know. <laughs> and, and then I suppose, I, you know, I knew how particular I was, so I was sort of terrified what was going to happen to me when I worked with a real actor. But also, I have been a theatre goer. I saw Judy Dench when she was a young woman acting. And, you know, you see someone who has got some spirit that is like, wow that just takes you and you know I knew there was a time and the time came you know I guess not so much an angel at my table was still bossing everyone around but the piano that I really wanted to have actors that were more experienced than I was um, and then try to somehow understand who they really are and let them you know let us together work it out and you know Harvey Keitel was really my mentor the first discussion with Harvey about how we were going to run things 
you know, um, on the telephone was pretty extraordinary. You know, I said to Harvey, oh, well, I'd really like you to play the role, but how's this going to work? You, you're a much more experienced actor than I am a director, but I still want it to be my film. Um, what do we do? I mean, and how am I going to tell you? You know, you get really annoyed. And he said, okay, Jane, <laughs> what about we try this? This is on the telephone, you know. Um, I will, you let me show you what I think should happen in a scene. And once I've done that, I will do anything you ask me. I will try anything. And I said, well, that sounds good. <laughs> And, you know, more or less that's what happened, but we also did rehearsals, and in those rehearsals I, I learned so much more from Harvey, you know, who was in, in love with acting and, and with the spirit of it and what, what's possible and what can be done. And, you know, I think a lot of it is this um, faith between the director and the actor and the love that you bring together and the trust that, you know, for one thing you've chosen them. That's a very big thing in life to be chosen. And, you know, I think you're the best and I'm, you know, I want you. And so when they, and they all have moments of doubt, when they have that, you know, you can, they are reminded that they have been selected, you know, and, and, and everyone gets very, very frightened at the beginning. I remember Holly more or less wanting to run away home. And I, I mean, I don't know how you survive these things. You, you just go to the next day, I guess, you know. <laughs> I mean, Holly actually ran out of the rehearsal room because she didn't like the sound of the piano. And we were like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you get, you get through things and you don't judge them and you know that it's just because they will really want to do a good job. And everyone's afraid of not being able to have that space or that place or that opportunity to do their best. And um, you, I, I think that, um, Nowadays, um, you know, you choose really great people. That makes a great difference. And ones that you personally love, you know, that you love their work and um, who are in the work. You know, they do like acting. They like exploring. And, and that, that makes it um, pretty easy. And, and you give them a good script. Um, it's a pretty good recipe. <laughs> Right. Um, yes, here. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, there's a mic right behind you. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask. I really the thing that I love about your films is it's always seems to me that the characters are fully formed, but still discovering and kind of trying to practice their intelligence. And I love this moment in second season of Top of the Lake where Robin kind of she's so much baggage, but then the moment she has an epiphany, everything else kind of falls away and she's able to keep going. And I wonder what's, like, what is your epiphany right now? What are you keen to discover more in your next project? In my life or? You're like, I don't know, what is your thing, what is your focus right now? What sort of, what sort of epiphanies do I think characters can have or? Well, just like, like what is your drive, like what do you drive? Why do now? I do it? Why have you, like you finished a project, what's the next thing, is there a yeah, moment or? Yeah, that's a good question. So I guess the question is, you know, why do we do what we do? Yeah, totally, 100. <laughs> um, you know, it's the burden of dreams, you know, in a way. I, um, I'm trying to be on holiday. <laughs> and then sometimes something comes and it captures you, you know. It's, I feel like it's done to me, you know, that's my story. <laughs> um, you know, raped by the imaginary world continuously, and I just, <laughs> I've, l I've learned to yield to it, no. <laughs> there is a sense, though, that um, if, if I, you know, I, can, I get taken by a mood or something that I can't quite see the whole of, and so the journey is about discovering what that is, um, or getting closer to it, maybe not knowing the whole thing ever, but, um, you know, looking, exploring, investigating, you know, feeling. Um, it's, it's great to see you. 
I've been hoping and wishing these many years that um, you would someday do Wuthering Heights. Have you ever thought of doing that? <laughs> I love Wuthering Heights so much. It's been really weathered though, hasn't it? <laughs> Mothering Lows, yeah. I mean, I've looked at that book and, you know, in a way, a lot of the energy and the expression of beautiful Emily Bronte is in the piano. The piano is kind of my Wuthering Heights um, from New Zealand and it always comforted me to know that one of the Bronte sisters' best friends immigrated to New Zealand and would write to them. And I always felt like, oh, and I, you know, actually I often go to the Bronte sisters' um, house and... Uh, um, Harwick and um, go down to that wa little waterfall with our, I even took ecstasy there with my sister. <laughs> <laughs> my first ecstasy. <laughs> it was brilliant. <laughs> Hi, thank you for being here. Both, thank you. Both the piano and uh, Bergman's Persona, for example, involve female protagonists who really do not speak. Holly Hunter and Liv Ullman. Um, I can't quite hear you. Can any? Can it? Is it on? Yeah, it's okay. better when you speak really close to it. Okay, both. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> both the piano and uh, Bergman's persona, for example, involve um, female characters who really do not speak. Holly Hunter and Liv Ullman, um, respectively, and persona really relies upon the strength and the starkness of its imagery to convey its story. And I was wondering, what did you find were the challenges of constructing a narrative where one of the protagonists, really the main protagonist, is silent throughout the film? Yeah, it's, um, it's a challenge. Um, I mean, I think one of the strengths of it is that, um, you know, you have a, um, the, a mystery that you're always wandering into that negative space or that quiet space, you know, what, sh what is she thinking? Um, but I remember at a certain point of getting this film ready, I was going like, how is this going to work, you know? Someone says something to her, she doesn't say anything back. Someone, <laughs> someone says something else, so we, you know, this is it's going to be kind of like, it could be really boring. Uh, and it was a real, like, trying to come to terms with it and we, started thinking, you know, Holly and I talked a lot about the sign languaging that she might do and she learnt a system that was sort of, a f for a while and, you know, she showed me what she was learning and, we, you know, we tried to do, do the research on what was the first sign, signing language and, you know, obviously she writes as well. So she only signs to her daughter. Um, and and we, we tried to adjust it so that it would, um, you know, when she first was doing it, Holly was going... <laughs> and it was kind of violent and rough looking and we said perhaps we could do it a little more elegantly and you know one of the funny things was that Holly and I you know we're quite blokey girls in a way you know I know we're fem great femmes as well but there's a good bloke in it, each of us so we were trying to imagine into this mysterious elegant femi creature that neither of us have quite ever been but we always wanted to be <laughs> and so we would discuss that like what did girls do you know and, you know, like making sure that we had enough of that in that. And, you know, when she put her little dainty foot out into the mud for the first time, you know. And when we, we sort of put words to the problems, we started to solve them. Um, and we were very much like sisters. We would just, you know, mutter together. And we never used acting language or any of that stuff, like verbs or whatever, you know. We'd just go like, what are we going to do here, you know. It, it, which isn't quite the answer to that question, but yes. <laughs> That, that's how it went along, you know, that, yeah, it was a, it was a positive and it was um, a struggle. And, and interestingly, you know, we got to the end of the film and um, Holly said, I'm feeling so sad. And I said, well, what, what, why, Holly? And she said, well, this is almost the very last scene that we're shooting and I still haven't said anything. <laughs> Um, I think it's just incredible how responsive the environments 
you create are to the character's kind of internal um, ongoings. And I, I think um, the kind of imagery you're able to surround the characters in, like the shadow play in Portrait of a Lady, and that kind of stultifying effect of Osmond on this young, impressionable woman, it really, for me, was the perfect encapsulation of Henry James's novel. Like, the house in Rome that was um, like the prison of the house of suffocation, the house of dumbness, that whole environment, the processional of when they're entertaining, it's as if none of the characters are breathing. They're all kind of regimented in their own way. But I guess my question is, uh, what imagery um, or what themes in art do you come back to that you've just been fascinated with? Because there's, I, I think the sense of isolation and, and loneliness in the characters is just really exquisitely rendered in all of your films. And their exploration of that and, and breaking through that um, is just a wonderful journey as a viewer to look at. So the imagery that you're inspired by and the themes. Could you speak to that, please? Um, well, you know, I love poetry, and I, th I was thinking about it a while ago, and thinking, um, I think I'm very, you know, influenced by poetry, or even though I'm not a poet myself at all, can't write it. Um, but there's that sense of the, um, you know, with Keats's poetry, or, you know, all poets, that, that they they make something that feels so easeful, and yet it's, it's the essence. And it's that sense of it always having been there because it's so honed, so, you know, like how, what effort poets go to, to to actually find that beauty and that ease and that memorable quality to, to the phrase or, the, or, or their work that, um, that inspires me. Um, so I want things to feel at once like they're effortless and at the same time that they um, haunt you. Um, and, and, you know, because I'm working in a visual forum, you know, one of the things as a, as a filmmaker and you try to do your own stuff or whatever is like that, and there's so many other films and, you know, am I just copying people or what's my own or who am I? One of the things I have found always so grounding and so amazing is when I'm working on a film that I'll have a, a seminal image that I've just seen on the street somewhere. It's something that's actually seen by me. And I remember for the piano, for example, I was thinking about, you know, Ada and the little girl and, you know, what they were. And I was just driving down the street and there was a, a tall girl and a short girl and they were walking very close together and they had this brown hair and it was in the sun and the, it was just shining and waving together. And I thought, that's, that's, that's Ada and Flora. That's, that's them. And that twinniness, that togetherness. That, I mean, that was the image that sort of made me know what to do with them. Do you often work this way, just grabbing images from your daily life? Uh, yeah, because I, you know, it's one of those ways that you know that it's, it's yours. <laughs> you know, oh, I felt that. And it's not just because, oh, I want to be original, but it, it becomes embodied in you. Yeah. And, and therefore, it's... Um, you know the truth of it. That's true to me, and that, that's very helpful. We can only take one final question, so yes, you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in how you prepare and work with cinematographers. Um, are you a filmmaker yourself? Yes. <laughs> Um, well, the first, the best thing is to choose a cinematographer who, who loves the project you're working on and um, whose work you respond to. Um, and then, um, you know, it's really hard. Everybody's so different. Each cinematographer is so unique. And um, I, I didn't know if I've had the perfect situation yet. Um, the first few films I made, I made with Stuart Dryberg, who actually lives here in New York um, now. And um, when we started working together, Stuart had been a gaffer for years and he'd been gaffering for extraordinary people, but he'd never actually shot a drama. And we couldn't get anybody else to shoot um, 
the Janet Frame story in Australia or New Zealand. I didn't seem to think it was worth their while. I don't know what it was, but we just couldn't find someone who had done drama before that would do it, or then if they'd had, the, the, it was really the bottom of the barrel. And so I looked at Stuart's um, cinematography, like from commercials, and thought, wow, he's got a beautiful lighting. And so, I, you know, he came to me and he said, I really want this opportunity. And, and because of the amount of gaffering he'd done, because gaff and he's also like architecture background, I just felt the whole thing could work. And um, we, yeah, we, we started off together really. And um, he has, um, he's just got a beautiful feeling for lighting. And, um, you know, I, I, I guess I did most of the works for shots. And uh, one of the things that we do is that we know that every, you know, like with my first and I, we discuss, that, you know, the, the, you know, the inevitable laziness of everybody and how how to get them going and how to get them started. So we give them give the DOP projects, you know, can you go and shoot the bush in so many different ways and find the right look and you know, let's try some blue underwater look. Can you try and find that for us? And then he'll do a presentation. So you know, that's that's one way of doing it. You know, other people, I'm, I'm asking that question myself, you know, like to other directors, what, what, what do you do? And people say, oh, we went through the whole film and, you know, in a week and, and I went, in a week? I, I, I don't know what they're doing. You know, it's like a mystery to me. I still don't get it quite. But um, I, I, th I think um, what I do now is like, you know, find a few problem scenes Scenes that I think are really challenging, like for example, in um, the second top of the lake, we have a big night scene um, when the suitcase is taken down through the graveyard and thrown out over the cliffs. And um, this was a new DOP I was working with, Jermaine McMickey, he's really good. Um, so he and I just went to that graveyard, and it's a huge graveyard. And you know, the thing was that we, we had this problem, like we'd go, um, we knew we were going to shoot at night, but we'd, we'd go before it was night, and then suddenly it was night and we couldn't see anything. <laughs> so um, we, I just go, I just keep going, you know. I, I'm for that, like, you keep going until you understand you've got it, you know. And, I, and in that graveyard, there were so many ways it could be done, but by the end of it, I knew that we had the best way of doing it, and that he and I had learnt that together, and... Um, and I, we did some drawings for it. We had to also do some CGI elements with it. And I mean, I felt by the end of that adventure and that time and that looking and the f photographs that we'd done and we put together and matched that um, we were a real team at that point. So I, I think it's, you know, the joint, working on a joint problem. Yeah. So I think we're going to end by showing a clip, if you're okay with that. Um, we have... Um, uh, a really great cl clip from um, Portrait of a Lady. I think it's um, I think one of the great scenes in your filmography, which is the seduction scene um, with. Uh, mm, goody. Uh, do you want to <laughs> do you want to set it up? Say anything about it or about Henry James or about um, before we see it? We yeah, I mean, um, Portrait of a Lady is one of my um, was one of my favorite books, and after the um, piano, you know, I had an opportunity to kind of um, do something I really love doing and. I guess like many people, I thought there was a, um, great stakes in doing some of the great novels. Yeah. And um, anyway, I love this book and this particular, I love the character um, of, of Isabel Archer and in, in a weird way she felt really Australian to me because um, even though I know she's American, um, it is probably more how the Australian experience is, you know, to coming to Europe um, because our country is so much younger than, you know, even America. And, you know, that sense of hopefulness and belief that we can know everything and, you know, we'll, you know, be unafraid and try for your future and, um, you know, is, is it, Isabel becomes preyed upon by, you know, very clever manipulators. Uh, and, and this is where it happens. Well, you can also see this film in full at 9 o'clock. We're showing it on a print um, in our retrospective. But um, I just want to thank Jane for being here tonight. She'll be back tomorrow to talk about Top of the Girl. And top of the Thank you all for coming.
So um, we'll just roll that clip. <laughs> 